Mm -hmm. Hey, everybody. Good evening. Welcome. Um, my name is Lars Torres, and I serve as uh, the executive director for Artisans Asylum. Hi, everyone out there. It's a thrill to welcome you to um, Ken Crestwell's uh, opening here at Artisans Annex. Um, Ken has been here for about the last 30 days, uh, working late nights uh, and uh, navigating our access issues, but persisting and um, producing a, a really exciting collection of work that um, I'm thrilled to, to share with you tonight. Ken is a, a graduate of uh, Leslie University uh, in the illustration program and uh, has a very, very exciting, promising career as a painter here in Boston. So I couldn't be happier, more thrilled to uh, hand the mic over to the artist, Ken Creswell. Take it away, Ken. Hey guys, wait, is it online? Cool. Hi, so welcome to my um, exhibition of my work I've done here. It's called Inner Sanctum. Um, it's basically everything in this, all the things I've worked on are a form of self portraiture. And um, they explore multiple ways that I view myself with uh, physically, like physical self portraits in sculpture um, and references to folklore and the occult and in a landscape that is representational, but also abstracted in its concepts. So um, I hope you guys enjoy. And let's take a look at these pieces of work. Let's talk about them, guys. So here, um, this is my desk. This was a uh, the first idea I had for this um, residency, I wanted to do a sculpture. Um, I imagined it larger, but the, th the thing I knew about this and liked was that I wanted to, I wanted it to be um, mimicking the process of an actual bird. When birds build nests, they, um, when birds build nests, getting AirPods in 2021, things birds, birds. like they bring different um materials together like uh, feathers and sticks and twigs and they collect things gradually to build it up and make it sturdy and that was a lot of the process here i i focused mainly on bringing things in from my room um because i was looking around my room one day and i realized just like just like how many things i had and like the, the mass of all of my junk and just things I didn't even need, but also how beautiful it all looked. It was all just like, it's all like a piece. Like my room is always an installation that represents everything coming out of me. And this is, um, this is a, a, it's a nest, it's a, it's a symbol of home. And um, it's also my take on maximalism, which is something that I've thought about a lot, especially um, during the pandemic because I'm constantly in my room and just thinking about it and also how you know maximalism versus minimalism which minimalism can be I feel like something that a lot of more um, that is a more privileged experience and a lot of times when you you aren't like wealthy like you material things are so are something you hold close to you because it becomes a symbol of like security and like I have instead of like not having and um I don't know, I just thought of uh, the beauty of what seems like chaos and often is. And all of these colors just really, it looks like my room, you know? And um, yeah, these are all things that are a part of me. <laughs> I have like wigs that I've worn that are ratty and like fake flowers I use to decorate my room. Um, these little arts and crafts supplies, actual le uh, leaves that I found from people's like dead Christmas trees they left out, um, string. I have a lot of yarn in here. Um, I use yarn in my hair to, and so I, I use these pieces of yarn that were directly, that directly came out of my hair, which is a very intimate thing. Like it has particles of me in this, you know, like 
trash that I've used. I don't know. I think it's really beautiful to see all the things you've collected in your mess and just what the stories they tell about yourself. The only thing I didn't use that was in my room was chicken wire. That was something that I, uh, I obtained, which I think is important because I needed a foundation for it to hold everything together, you know, which is like your security, your chicken wire. Okay, so moving on to this landscape. So this is interesting. You could, I didn't know what I was going to do with this. I didn't even know what it was going to be. But um, over this year, I've been going through a journey of like familiarizing myself with my ancestors and and how I feel connected to them um, with certain, with in land and bodies of water. I find that anytime I'm near a body of water, I can connect myself to home no matter where I am. And, you know, in some ways this is, you know, a landscape, but in many ways it to me feels like an abstract piece. You know, it isn't necessarily what you would consider like abstract expressionist, like it's not Jackson Pollock or that guy, but I feel like it's, it, it kind of feels like an accumulation of doodles, which is what I really like with trying to keep into the form of what you might think land, a land mass or a landscape looks like. But also there's many parts of this where you couldn't necessarily say what it is, which is what I like. There's, um, you know, I folk, I emphasized a lot of like the green of land, like, which I feel very connected to and like the maybe like swamp and like rivers and the really important parts of this piece especially are this eye, which, you know, I have a lot, of, a lot of times when I draw landscapes, I feel called to make like a giant sun somewhere, you know, to like give it like a point of focus. But I found like, I feel like the, what brings this whole thing together is like my sight. And like, when I see like these beautiful like landscapes, you know, throughout my day, like at the park and it, so, you know, it brings tears to my eyes. And I feel like they can feel mysterious. Like, why am I crying? You know, like, it's not just because it's beautiful. It's because I feel like a connection to the people who I don't, I've never met and I can't see that are living through me every day. And the moon, um, crescent moon, because I'm a crest well. And I, I started to think of, you know, the name Crestwell to me just sounds very um, celestial. And um, it makes me think about if you have a well and you can see the reflection of the moon in it. And the moon to me is always a symbol of hope and like family and it like ties me back to something that's always there. It's like a constant. But yeah, there's um the thing about pieces like this, it's really fun because I can think so many different things as I'm doing it. But the the most beauty I find in things like this is that the viewer can see so many things that I wasn't thinking of or that I never considered and can give me even a new perspective on it. And that's why I like putting so many different little details in here because there's a lot of points you could draw to connect to your own life that I might not even um, feel, you know? Okay, and so, the next piece I want to talk about is um, this tarot card. So this is uh, the Empress tarot card from the Major Arcana tarot deck, I guess. Um, and this is um, also a self-portrait, like all the pieces here. This is, but this feels like a more direct self-portrait. I have um, a strong connection to antelope animals, like such as like gazelles, uh, springbok, impala. And I, I use this animal as a symbol often, um, you know, kind of like an amalgamation of like all these different species of antelope. But I feel like what I, I often draw like, you know, more like a anthropomorphic antelope, but this, this time I decided to make it more like I'm, maybe this is actually me or like a person wearing a mask you know, I like kind of references like a lot of African masks that have like um, 
you know, the local animals carved into it. And there's, you know, I've seen a lot of these antelope masks and I kind of turned it into my own version of that. Um, you know, the Empress, it's symbolized, she, the tarot card symbolizes um, motherhood and like creation, um, you know, the harvest. Um, and it kind of represents this point in my life actually where I was wearing yarn that was orange and like I was dressing with a brighter color palette and you know I was thinking so much about like motherhood and like lineage like around the spring and you know it makes sense and it's become a part of my life where you know I like to think about my life in like the many stages and like the different aspects of myself that are reflected and um yeah this felt it felt it's kind of like the de like the the yin aspect of my life. Okay. Um, so the next one we're going to talk about is um, another tarot card. This is um, the High Priestess. Um, this is another tarot card that I really identify with. You know, it's also self portrait. It's the antelope mask, but this is the High Priestess, who symbolizes intuition and like mystery and higher knowledge and um, spiritual enlightenment. And, you know, she, she also, this is my take on it. There's a lot of different symbols when you look at the description of the original tarot card depiction. But for me, this is so much like this really powerful, like priestess, like this witch, this like sorceress with like, and she's like so heavy with the weight of knowledge. You know, it kind of feels like often there's points in my life where I feel way more introspective and just so overwhelmed by the amount of spiritual like messages and just like paths I'm going through that it's like, you know, it's like, like, you know, it's like a cigarette. You're just like really more, more like in inward. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know. I, what I really like about this one is that I really like, both of these, I feel like really look like me. Like I did it intentionally. I, I don't know if you can see this, but I try to make them my height. And I try, I tried to dress like both of them, with both of their colors in my outfit. But um, I don't know, there was a time when I was, I had the gray yarn as well. And I feel like, I don't know, like every time I do a different hair color, it, it says something about where I'm at. And this is a point that I'm often at. And, yeah, I feel like this, this also, this card very much symbolizes like the balance of the yin and yang, the masculine, the feminine, dark light. Um, and I just, it really is, um, it's, it's, it's very much a reflection of like who, how I feel about myself, you know, it's like the, the finding the balance of those energies and just like embodying like this, this priestess, you know, this knowledge share, sharer. <laughs> okay, next. So this is another nest, but this is, uh, you could say a fairy nest. I've called it, uh, this piece is actually called Sanctuary. I made it a year ago, but I decided to revisit it and tweak it in some ways. My main thing was, I want it to feel like you're peering into maybe, the, the dwelling of like this small creature and that in that and in, in that no matter even the, though the creature is so different from you you find like such a similarity in the emotion like I had her looking in this mirror it kind of feels like a bedroom in a way like maybe there's posters also kind of feels like it's an internal environment that also looks external because of all the nature imagery and you know it's it's also a self-portrait it feels like in a way, I feel like my room looks like that, you know, like all the colors, like those are all colors that are like me, like that I wear and that I decorate with. Um, I don't know. It's, it's a very self-reflective piece, like more than the, the rest. The rest feel more representational of who I am. And this one feels more like a reflection on just like being, you know, like um, I want it to feel very safe but also vulnerable and poignant one of the my favorite details about this piece is you can see there's 
she originally had four wings. You know, there's like the top wings and the bottom too, but one of them was missing when I found this little statue. And I just thought it was really beautiful because it's, I thought about it as like someone who might think, you know, they have like these flaws that they can't see past and they're just looking in their reflection like, oh, like this is me or just like, I wish I, I looked some, some other way or something. But all the beauty about this figure is just reflected in everything else, you know, around her. And I don't know, I, I really have a special place in my heart for this piece, especially. Yeah, um, next one, last one. Um, so this is quite literally a self-portrait of my actual face. Um, <laughs> this was something that I worked on earlier in the summer, I think. And um, it was definitely a very amazing process because, you know, I've always draw been a, an artist. I've always been like drawing and like painting, but I feel like a lot of the painting I've been doing is more um, um, abstract kind of things or like, uh, like the tapestry is more flat and like color blocks. And I feel like this piece was kind of like a way, especially with the size of the canvas, I rarely use a canvas that size. And I feel like it was um, uh, um, kind of a meditation on my own face and like details. And I, I don't, I never go to like draw or paint anything to be like representational or like hyper-realistic. to like really like the antithesis of my art. But this is actually, I studied my face. I looked in the mirror while I painted it. And I just, I remember painting this and at a certain point when I was doing the face, cause I started with the hair and when I was doing the face, I started to be like, I don't know, I started falling in love with like this person. I was like, like, oh my God, like he's so beautiful. Like she's so beautiful. Like, and I don't know. And it, it was at the point where I was really drawing the features I saw in my face and not just like drawing what, how I wanted it to look. And, you know, I, it didn't come out in a way that I was like, I don't like this. Like it came out more beautiful than I could have imagined because I focused on the features of my actual face like the positioning of my cheekbones, like dimple in the chin, like div divot like above the lips and like the eyebrow shape and the shape of the head. The hair was also an amazing process to, because, you know, I, I don't spend that much time focusing on the details of like drawing, like, a, you know, like rendering, I guess. And like, I, they don't look like braids per se, but it has the shape of my, of like the yarn in a way. And, the color of yarn I was wearing had like red and like those details of like yellow and blue and purple. And I really just tried to focus on that and like, I don't know, it really looks beautiful. It looks like, it looks like I'm like laying back in the water and it's just my head is visible and my hair is coming up around me. You know, I'm a Pisces. I am in the water and iridescent at all times. <laughs> and I really identify with green. That's another thing. I, I rarely um, paint myself with like my actual skin color. It's also been like a thing of like being a brown person and trying to find what color your skin is with the crayons at a very young age and being like, well, I'm not this shade of brown and I'm not peach. So couldn't mix those crayons together. Being an artist for the past few years in school has been like mixing a bunch of different paint colors to the point where I was like, okay, I think I found a formula like for essentially my foundation <laughs> when I'm painting myself. But then I got to this point where I was like, the nature of my art is so fantastical and drawing myself as like the most realistic thing, you know, as like I am, doesn't have to be realistic per se. And I really identify with green, like having, actually having green skin, I kind of identify with in a way, you know, like I, I um, consider myself to be, I connect myself a lot to fae creatures, like fairies and elves and like hobgoblins and things like that. And I, I honestly feel like, like, th like those entities are like spirits that are guiding me through life and they help me find things and they reveal things about me and they take me down paths I've never been down before. And I think like seeing myself portraying myself with this green skin, it kind of feels like, you know, a reflection of all that, like 
divine, you know, and this is supposed to be such a divine like portrait. I love my face. I'm actually obsessed with it. Thank you, mom, for the beautiful face. <laughs> but yeah, that's a, I hope you guys like that because I, I do, I like these. And, and, and I hope this, this is me. This is so that's all I can say. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Our cameraman, Thank you. Jonathan, Thank you. doing an amazing Thank job tonight. tonight. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Um, um, what a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, so, so I want to start, start, a little start a little Q and A here. here. Um, um, kick it off kick it with, off with uh, uh, folks who are here on um, on Zoom, and then I think some folks are also on, on YouTube. YouTube. Um, but yeah, you can probably pop those, those out. Um, I think we're going to be talking. Can, is audio good here? Can folks hear us? We've switched mics. Yeah, I see, yeah, uh, see uh, Ms. Maloney nodding. Awesome. Is that mom? Yeah. Hey. <laughs> yeah, you say hi. Hi, mom. Here, I'll pull this down a little bit. Um, all right, so how about um, if if I stay over here, I'm in the camera, and if you could probably go just a little further over so we keep our, I don't uh, put you at risk. Um, oh, yeah. And, oh, no, come in just a bit here, and then we'll try yeah. to talk here. Sorry, we haven't rehearsed everyone, but uh, you're doing amazing. This Thank is you. So exciting. Um, I wanted to start at the beginning. So roll us back a little bit because this is a, a fey and a fantastic magical world. So I want to get into it. But to do that, I want to start at the beginning. Okay. So where where are you born? Where's home? Uh, I For me, I think home is Boston now, but I was okay. born in Maryland. In Maryland. Okay. Yeah. All right. And one of the things that I've heard um, is important to you as you think about um, populating your rich world and bringing that out here is ancestors. Mm -hmm. How far back can, can you go when you think about ancestors? Uh, well, I know, I mean, I know there's a, I have family from uh, like the Carolinas and I guess like right the Florida area. I don't know that much about it um, in detail. Like yeah. my name is Scottish, um, okay. but also in a weird way, I feel like kind of connected to that because my name is like, or the name Cresswell for my dad is such as like a niche kind of like family name. Like not a lot of people have it. And in fact, it's like most people I feel like that have it in America are gonna be like black and or they're actually gonna be related to me, which is okay. really interesting. And the only other place there's like really Cresswell is like in the UK. In the UK, yeah. And it's, it's interesting. I like having a niche last name. I used to not like it when I was like, one day someone told me it sounded like a Hogwarts professor and I was like all right, right. I like You're that, with that. <laughs> but um yeah I mean okay. for me like ancestry like I am someone who's very connected to what's it other realms you know mm. like like I'm very in touch with the spirit and like and not just like I think about it a lot but I I get like messages like I communicate you know like I practice divination to communicate Okay. And I feel like the ancestors are mostly like I, you know, I have a picture of someone, but I don't know like who that is. I feel like for me, ancestors is like it's what you feel and like you know when you when you when you ask and like like you know you put something out and who is like bring, giving bringing something back to you, you know, like yeah. um, calling out and who is um, receiving that and. You know, it's kind of, in a way, it's become like ancestors have become simultaneous with a form of God. You know, like I think about God as the source, which I don't necessarily think of ancestors as the source, but I feel like they are like uh, this, the the people I pray to. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. um, I see God as more of like. Um, like this celestial womb, you know, where just things just like came out of. And I see ancestors, it's like, this is very individual to me. Like even like people with a similar background as me, it's still not the same. Like these are mine, you know? Like, yeah. Um, and yeah, I feel, I feel like in a lot of times, I was saying this earlier, I don't, I often have trouble talking about my work. It probably doesn't seem like it, <laughs> but I, I don't, I'm just really good at talking. I just don't really usually have artist statements or anything yeah. 
especially when I'm doing landscapes and like sculpture, it's very much like intuitive. And I feel like ancestors sometimes like I channel those like um, those energies, like this, like, you know, through the veil comes this energy. And then I'm just like, mm -hmm, like, you know, you know. Um, in a way, you, you through your artwork play the role of a medium almost. Actually, that's a kind of cool way to think about it. Yeah. Okay. I mean, a lot of times it's like, I like have concepts, like, especially with the tarot cards, you know, the, these are things that I, that are come about spiritually over time, but they're mm -hmm. more meditated, like, portraits of myself and like these metaphors that I've already identified with but you know landscape sculpture those are very much like the, those I consider even if my landscape was extremely representational and had like houses and bridges it would still feel like the, the way I uh, produce and like conceptualize is very abstract yeah well and I, I I love how you think about ancestry as both being something what you know um you know, it's been passed down verbally or through the family, but it's also what you feel connected to because we're, we're stardust and as they say, right? These ancient particles and who knows what's carried forward through those. But most of us came to America, um, you know, forced and unforced to, to, to build something new here. And so building one's understanding of past and ancestry mm -hmm. and being able to do it in such a archetypal way I think is a wonderful journey that you're beginning. And uh, I can't wait to see more of this. Um, so tell me a little bit about um, sort of mythology. You also talk about the occult and mythology. Is, is there a, a set of myths or a myth that most influenced you at an early age that, that you remember is opening yourself to this world? Is, is, is there a story that you can recollect? I mean, I read a lot. I can, I remember I often would be, would read or parents would read to me from books. Like there's, we had a book of Aesop's fables and mm. there's this book of Japanese fairy tales, which I think I was read to a little bit, but I kind of like read through it because I was, I started reading fast. And I, what I think, I don't necessarily have an exact story. I feel like the stories that I, thought about more precisely were more like along the lines of like fairy tales because of like Disney stuff mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. these like also very inspired me because something about them always kind of scared me but it was fascinating it, it, it was haunting and you know I didn't yeah. have words for that as a kid but I just I I, I held on to loving the, the the use of different animals and how they represent archetypes and like um like how they, you know, how they, how they come across in a story, like, you know, and a lot of, in Aesop's fables, and like a lot of other fairy or fables from other cultures, there's like Foth kind of character mm. that's always, that can be kind of like a trickster or someone <laughs> who is, you know, like being really chaotic and they have to learn the lesson. And I always liked like that kind of character. Um, I, yeah, I, oh, I also there, um, I was really inspired by uh, this story, this this book that I grew up reading called The People Could Fly. And it was about, uh, it's about ancestors. You know, it was about um, slaves. Come to the camera. Sorry. Yeah, it's in there. Yeah. It's, a, it's about um, like slaves and they like, you know, African slaves. And, you know, it was the kind of thing where it was like a symbol of like um, um, escaping oppression and like freeing themselves. And they like, were able to fly and mm. I don't remember it actually that detailed but I remember like reading it and just you know I'd already seen a lot of Disney and read a bunch of stories about these animals and seeing these drawings of like people that look like me and they're like a part of this like fantastical story was so inspiring because I was like oh my god like my people have like these like stories too and like there's also this one um that I saw on the show between the lions where they read books like to kids, it was really, it was kind of like a reading rainbow thing, I guess, but they had these creepy lion puppets <laughs> doing all of it. And there's this one story that stuck with me so hard because me and my brother, it scared us. <laughs> like it was called Abby Yo Yo. And it's, I love it so much. You probably heard there is this musician, Pete Seeger, who does like a really beautiful telling of Abby Yo Yo. But Abby Yo Yo is like um, originally, um, I think, a West African folktale. And 
it's about this this son and his da or this dad and his son and they they uh, the dad has like this ukulele or something and they keep playing the ukulele and everyone's getting annoyed they're like go go away like you're annoying us leave town and mm -hmm. and I think I actually think there's another reason I think the dad does something that I can't remember <laughs> but they have to leave and then but then this giant comes and his name's Abby Yo Yo and all the people in the village are like oh no like this giant's gonna crush our homes and eat is eating our cattle. And then, but then the boy like plays this, plays Abby Yo Yo a song that he like about himself. Like he's like, Abby Yo Yo. And, and you know, it's, and then so they, they defeated the monster by making him laugh and then he fell to the ground. And the father, the father, the father's a wizard. And so he just like zoop zaps and then Abby Yo Yo disappears. And everyone's like, oh my God. Like, and they invite the, the, the two back to the village and like, you saved the day. And I always love that story because not only were they, the main characters were black, but um, it was just, I don't know, it was just really cool because it was like, a, it didn't feel like necessarily a hero story per se, mm -hmm. but it was kind of like, a, you know, people, it just felt like such an ordinary way for these like two people to uh, save the day. Through laughter, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. how wonderful is that? It was just charming, and I, I loved how scary it was for some because the the music was so beautiful and like it it like made me emotional. But like the giant scene was like they made it so scary, and I just <laughs> love that those like parts of folk tales where they're like, uh oh, like. <laughs> well, I love one of the things you said too about um, in in some of the stories you love best. There's this moment where you're on the one hand repulsed, or you feel a lot of fear towards the character or the situation, but something is irresistible about it. You're drawn toward it, right? The moth toward the flame or whatever. Yeah. And I was thinking about your um, empress and high priestess here. Um, sorry for the folks here, you can't see them, but their eyes strike me because they're empty. I don't know if you can get a shot of that, Jonathan, maybe you're, um, but they're, they're, they're big and they're almost like, you know, the, Sometimes we say that the eyes are windows to the soul. And in these, it's almost like you have to invest a lot in there to find the soul yourself. Mm -hmm. It's like, it gives you what you give to it. Wow. Um, that, that's how I saw that. And that was the piece that made them very scary for me was, was the eyes. So interesting. Honestly, that, that, now that you say that, it makes sense. Like, you know, I intentionally- Here, maybe you can come. Oh yeah, I intentionally Sorry. didn't um, make, give them like eyes, like pupils, because usually I would do that if I was doing like an, an anthropomorphic antelope, but mm. this is a mask. And so I thought, and I was like, I don't want to have little eye holes when you see the person. And I thought about coloring them, but I left them white because yeah. it kind of felt like, a, like, you know, these are like these magical archetypes and they have these white eyes. But also it does make sense how you're saying like, you know, there's a lot of times like I've gone to like museums or looked online at, like these African masks and like mm -hmm. spent so much time in those exhibits of like all these stolen artifacts um, by colonizers mm -hmm. put on display because, you know, and then in some point it's like this is the only time I'm seeing like my people in this museum, even though it's a mask and like little statues and like, mm -hmm. um, and so I honestly like how you said that because it kind of is a little scary now that you're thinking about it, but that's what I liked about those masks is yeah. that you know, for some reason, they're a little bit scary because it feels like, like they're supposed to, it's, it has a weird line between showing you like this really is this animal, like trying to look like the animal, but also has like a level of abstraction to it that like, you know, I feel like masks are something that in a, across cultures, people wear them. And sometimes they can be a little creepy because it's not, you know, that's not the person's mm -hmm. face, but then a person is wearing it. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. the only, like, sometimes they have a whole costume, but like, I feel like, especially when it's just the head and it's like, you know, like I made it clear that it's not like the same color as a person. Yeah. 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 I thought about making it like adding different details to it, but I really oh, feel like yeah. I, I like that. I feel like I copied and pasted it in a way from like the other ancestral drawings we've done to like, Bring that theme together. Yeah, and your illustration skills really come out in in those pieces, which I love. Okay, last question, and then we'll open it up here, um, also for Zoom. So one of the things I want to focus on on this picture for a second, and I'm going to pull it up. Um, 
for everyone here. Hopefully you can see this. There's a lot of texture in this picture, which I really love. You've really been um, unrestrained with the paint. Um, so just kind of building, which to me really augments the idea of landscape, right? You start to get the texture and landscape is texture if nothing else. Mm -hmm. But I'm really interested in this lower area here at the bottom of the screen. I don't know if folks could see it, but it looks like a cavern, mm -hmm. sort of like the underworld, the belly. Um, was that, were you thinking of anything in particular yeah. in putting that together? And if so, um, what, what, did, what does that represent to you? Um, I actually was thinking of, um, it took me a while to figure out what to put in that space. Because mm. I knew, I thought about it as like a belly, like, so you, you know, up and else kind of like a cave. Um, and I, um, I, my, I just, I, it's also like a cavern to me. I thought about like stalagmites. And one time for my mom's birthday, we went to Luray Caverns in Virginia. And like, you know, you, I would always see the trailer on TV, but like when you see it in person, it looks so crazy. And it's one of those things where it's like, how is this real? Like, how is this on earth? But then that's, I feel like that's one of the things I really like that I added to this because this, that's one of the only things in this painting that kind of actually mimics things in real nature. Like you could say, oh yeah, it looks like a hill, but I, I intentionally made the perspective look, you know, like you couldn't really tell like what necessarily is happening. You know, I guess you could say the trees, but I use a more manicured shape for them. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. the stalagmites, I think I wanted, to, they're, they're like the most, that's, that's something you actually see. You know, it doesn't look exactly like mine, but I think it it's cool because in my work, I, I like to take um, ordinary things and and bring them into the world of, um, into a world of like magic and like whimsy. And then to take something like these stalagmites that in real life already look like something like magical or just like unreal. And to put that in here, I feel like is, is like kind of like, you know, the perfect addition. Yeah, well, I really like it. I think for me, that's a focal area in your work because it, when I think about the ancestral realm, um, like many of us, you know, I'm torn between, is it the stars or is it beneath our feet? Mm -hmm. And so when, when you've produced a world that, that is, you know, beneath the ground, I do think of that as sort of an ancestral realm. Um, and then having the Empress to the right, she bears, um, I think those are pomegranates. Yep. What, what, what do pomegranates sort of symbolize um, in your um, iconography? Well, I mean, this actually comes from the tarot card. Oh, got it. Exactly. And the pomegranate is like a, it's a symbol of fertility and like the divine feminine, also Persephone, the goddess Persephone. Mm -hmm. of spring. Yeah. So, and there's actually pomegranate in the Empress too. Underneath my thesis, that's also simple in her car. Here, come um, talk to the folks here. I don't know if they right. caught that. Caught that. Sorry, this is also a. Uh, you want me to say a thing about pomegranates? Sure. Yeah, we can repeat it. Well, the pomegranates, um, the pomegranates and the empress are, um, found in the actual tarot card. And they symbolize like uh, fertility and like the divine feminine and Persephone. Persephone symbol is the pomegranate, mm. and the pomegranate is also in the high priestess tarot card because. Her card also embodies the divine feminine and um, darkness and light, which is per Persephone, you know, the goddess of springtime who is sent to the underworld. Mm. And, but um, for the high priestess, I changed, I think I took out more symbols or like I altered it in more ways, um, but I used, I showed the pomegranate as like a little pendant, just mm -hmm. like as a reference. On the high priestess, yeah, it's, it's visible over there. Well, I, and that gets to the last theme I, I see here, which is, you know, I hear uh, the, the, the connection to the fairy world. And at least in the United States, I think maybe Ir Irish folks would disagree and possibly Scottish, but fairies aren't seen as strong creatures. It's Tinkerbell and, you know, you know these, these very um, highly, um, I don't want to say feminized because that's the wrong word, but infantilized creatures that don't have a lot of strength, but your characters are badass. Yeah. You have like, you're kind of like bringing a badass fairy into this world. And I hope we'll see more of that kind of 
strength through these ancestral traditions that aren't sort of like fully born American myths yet. Mm -hmm. But if there was ever a good time in the US to start rebuilding and recombining form and mythos to create new creatures or new ways of understanding our inner selves, I think is a wonderful time. That for me is the epitome of um, being black and of diaspora is we um, constantly looking for, oh, where do we come from all this stuff? And it's like, uh, for this, as long as we've been here, all we've been doing is taking what we have and making it into our thing. You know what I'm saying? Like taking beauty out of things that are scary or that you don't understand and like incorporating all these things and just like looking for the who am I and everything. Mm. Just like, everything is just a, a remix that becomes original. <laughs> right on. Well, we, we, we can close there. I think that's a beautiful note to close on. Do we want to open it up here? Uh, folks can type your questions in the chat.